Well, again, it is so good to be with you here today. If you're new with us or new online, we're in the middle of a series called What I Wish I'd Known Sooner, and we're looking at some of those important biblical lessons that are, that are better learned early, earlier than later. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Greg Tonkinson, who spoke last week. If you missed his message, it was awesome, and I want to encourage you to go online and definitely find that. Well, we've been living in interesting times, have we not? The last couple of years have been crazy, not only in this country, but around the world. We'd have, we've had COVID, we've had racial issues, we've had all sorts of other tensions. We've had the church being shut down and um, the economy being shut down amongst other things. And just when you think it's over, it's not. Just when you think it's over and we're like, well, hey, I think we've made it through, we're not. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but the United States has been butting heads with two powerhouses, two superpowers, Russia and China. Have you been seeing this in the news? <clears throat> yes, uh, Russia's uh, tinkering with the idea, I guess, of invading the Ukraine. And of course, that has a bearing on the United States. And so we're, you know, uh, have, have our eyes on that situation. And of course, there's China and Taiwan. And so the United States is also focused on that as well. To make matters more complicated, we're talking about putting sanctions on Russia. And simply put, Russia's not afraid because China will bail them out. And that leaves us in a very precarious situation because we do not necessarily have the authority maybe that we thought we did in this situation. Now, to make matters incredibly more complicated, I don't know if you saw this, but the Chinese government recently stunned the world by testing a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile that they launched into low-orbit space not too long ago. Did you see this? So if the world weren't crazy enough already... And if you thought, well, we've made it through the bad stuff, uh, I don't know that we have. <laughs> I don't know that we have. Now, if you're not familiar with a hypersonic missile, you need to be. They differ from the older intercontinental ballistic missiles in several significant ways. First is their speed. Hypersonic missiles can fly up to 4,000 miles an hour, which is basically a mile a second, which means that hypersonic missiles are capable of reaching anywhere in the world in less than an hour. Um, so they're incredibly fast. And then secondly, unlike the older intercontinental ballistic missiles, the new generation of hypersonic missiles can actually change course in flight. The old missiles that you and I grew up with in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, the Cuban, the, the ones that Kennedy drove out of Cuba, those missiles had to be launched and they stayed on a direct course. And they were a little bit slower, so when they were launched, you knew that there was time, that there would be time unless they're off the coast of Cuba, we would have time to react. The new hypersonic missiles are so incredibly fast and they can change course, uh, thus avoiding radar detection. Add to this that China's now launched them into outer space, can get them into outer space and circling the globe. It means that, what this means is that an attack could be launched against the United States and we wouldn't even know it. The old intercontinental ballistic missiles, we would know that they were coming. We'd have a short time to get ready, maybe two hours or so. If they were launched from Russia or China, we'd have some time to react. No more, no more. They can launch these things from outer space. They're incredibly fast. They can avoid radar detection. Folks, that is the world that we are living in. Aren't you encouraged? <laughs> Aren't you encouraged? The good news is God's in control, amen? Amen, that's what we know. We can look at the world and it can be as crazy as ever that we gather as saints and we are reminded that God is in control. But here's the deal. The weapons today are becoming increasingly sophisticated, more dangerous, more deadly. They're mind-blowing. It's just mind-blowing to think of where we are. But do not be mistaken, do not be mistaken, just because a weapon is older and has been around for a long time doesn't mean that it can't be incredibly dangerous. Some of the most dangerous weapons in human history are some of the oldest, and ironically, some of the smallest. And the weapon that we are going to be looking at today has started more wars than any other weapon in human history. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear saints of God, it's my honor to take us to the Word of God today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. It is my honor to present to you the Word of God this morning. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. 
Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Verse 5. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Verse 11, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Amen. Again, church, hear the word of God this morning. So in our passage, we are introduced to one of the smallest and most powerful weapons in the history of the world, that is the human tongue. And what makes this particular weapon so incredibly unique is that everyone's got one. Everyone has got one. From the least to the greatest, every human being is in possession of one of the most powerful weapons in all the world. Doesn't that encourage you? Because there are some crazy people out there, right? I mean, they're out there. They're not in here. They're out there, and they've got tongues. It makes me worried. It's a weapon that we carry with us everywhere we go, and we put to use every day of our lives. And again, everyone's got one. There are those that are screaming in this country that we have a gun problem. You know what we really have? We've got a tongue problem. Amen? We need our politicians to be quiet. <laughs> we need our university professors to start being quiet. We got too many people saying too many crazy things in the world today, which brings us to a critically important lesson that I want to stress today. It's a lesson that we learned as children. It's a lesson that's easy to forget about, but it is a lesson that you see all throughout the pages of the Bible, and it is simply this. Your tongue will either prove to be your single greatest asset or your single greatest liability in this lifetime. Choose wisely. Your tongue, my tongue, will either prove to be either our single greatest asset or our single greatest liability in this lifetime. So choose wisely, proceed with caution. So in our passage today, James highlights that even though the tongue is incredibly small, it is nonetheless incredibly powerful, as if we needed to know that. All of us, if you've been alive for any length of time, know the damage the tongue can do. Many of us have scars, deep scars, deep wounds from childhood, from families, from friends, from the schoolyard, because of what the tongue has done to us. We say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is not true. There's nothing true about that statement. And James demonstrates that. And he demonstrates that by giving us some real life analogies to drive home his point. And the first is this, he uses a horse. A horse. How many have ever owned a horse? They're great animals, aren't they? They're right up there with dogs and dolphins. There's dogs, dolphins, and horses, amen? I mean, there's just some animals that are better than others. And this is, you know, cats are low. I'm sorry, if you're a cat person, do I hear an amen? Thank you. Neurotic, narcissistic animals. Horses. He says this, James says this, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Now, horses, of course, are incredibly large and powerful animals, incredible animals. Horses, believe it or not, and you probably aren't, this shouldn't surprise you, can pull three times their body weight over long distances. They're just incredible animals. Horses' legs are so strong that they can kick with a force easily reaching 2,000 pounds per square inch. And you're going, what's the big deal about that? To put that into perspective, that easily exceeds the punching power of the hardest hitting heavyweights on the planet today. And yet, despite this incredibly raw power, a horse can be manipulated to do whatever it is we want to do with a bit no bigger than your thumb placed in its mouth. Go figure. Go figure. 
If you've ever ridden a horse, then you know the tiniest movement on the reins, and probably everybody in here has ridden a horse, you know the tiniest bit of movement on the reins is more than enough to get this huge beast with all of this power to do exactly what you want it to do, just a little pull. Such is the power of the tongue, according to James. It's incredibly small, but incredibly powerful. And if we're not incredibly careful, it can be a huge liability in this lifetime. And that's important, you guys, because in a day and age where everyone has a voice because of the internet, everyone is speaking up. Everyone's got something to say. It is important that we as Christians distinguish ourselves with what rolls off our tongues. Amen? We have an opportunity to shine in this generation by what we say and how we use this little thing in our mouth, this little weapon that everybody has. We can distinguish ourselves in a significant way by how we use it. Now, next, James appeals to ships. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. How many of you have ever been on a cruise? Why haven't you invited me? This is the first I've heard of this. Do you see the rudders right there? Those rudders belong to this ship, the Carnival Glory. Let me go back and show you. Those are the rudders. Those two little things guide that ship. That is incredible. Today's modern cruise liners are literally floating cities, are they not? Complete with restaurants, water parks, gyms, movie theaters, and the list goes on and on and on. You can get on a ship and get lost. <laughs> Nevertheless, just like a bit in the mouth of a horse, so a rudder on a ship, though relatively small, can be used to navigate gigantic ocean liners all around the world with no effort with little effort, just the movement of a joystick, a little movement of the rudder, and these gigantic cities go wherever they, we want them to. And folks, that is incredible. Such is the power of the tongue. Again, if it's not used carefully, it can be a liability. And in this day and age, folks, we as Christians, life is so short, and what rolls off our mouth is so very important. We do not have time to waste. The days are evil, and the voices are loud. If ever there were a time in which Christians need to use their voices to make a difference, I would argue it is now. But unfortunately, we're human. And James knows this. And so he says, you know what? We can use our tongues in incredibly evil ways. And he gives us a really good example. He says it right here. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. What is the internet? I've said it before. If not a platform to tell people how great your life is, right? That's why Facebook was created, to let you know how great my life is. I've got no problems. I eat great food. I live in a great house. I, have a, I never have any problems. Just go to my Facebook account and you'll see. This is so very important. Boasting and bragging, it's common, very common to all of us. It's very common to all of us. You know, when I share the gospel, I often use the law to convict the conscience. And I do that by simply asking some very simple questions. Like, for example, have you ever told a lie? And people go, yes, I have told a lie. And I say, well, what do we call people that tell lies? We call them liars, right? And then I always ask them the second question, have you ever stolen anything? And they always say, most people go, no, I, I haven't ever stolen anything. And of course, I always say, well, you just told me you were a liar. Why should I believe you? <laughs> But I do say this, to get them to understand this. I say, have you ever stolen the glory that belongs to God and kept it for yourself? Something great happened in your life and you said, look at me, look at how awesome I am. And without fail, people go, yes, I do that all the time. I boast and I brag about the things that are going on in my life as if I accomplished them and not God. We as humans, were great at boasting and bragging. And James knows this and he hits the nail on the head. As I was preparing this message and I was thinking throughout the Bible, I'm thinking, well, is there a good example of someone boasting and bragging? There was. One came to my mind, and you know who it was? This guy right here, Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4. He's king of Babylon. And it says this. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, listen to this. This is classic. This is a great verse. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Whoops. You know, I can look at somebody like Nebuchadnezzar and go, how could he do that? 
And yet I do that all the time. The guy that does that is in the mirror almost every morning in some way, shape, or form. And either I do it as an individual or I do it as an American, right? America is the greatest country on the earth, and it is. But there's sometimes I'm boasting in a way that crosses lines. My hope is in our military. My hope is in our economy, not in the Lord. And that's dangerous. That is dangerous. As you know, God was none too pleased with Nebuchadnezzar for such boasting. And it so goes on to say this, while the words were still on the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the most high rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will. You want to know how seriously God takes pride and boasting? That serious. That serious. Lest we forget. Everything that Nebuchadnezzar had, including the very breath in his lungs, was a gracious gift from God, which serves as a powerful reminder to every one of us in this room right now and everybody watching online, that everything we have, including the very breath in our lungs right now, is a gracious gift from God. Amen? I always say to people, name one thing that you have that hasn't been given to you by God. You can't. You can't. I would argue even the very faith that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ is a gift from God. Why do I say that? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. You have nothing to boast about, even if, with regard to your salvation. Right? The only thing that you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary. Even the very faith you have is a gift of God. Paul said it this way to the Corinthians. What do you have that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? We as, we as humans have a very bad problem, and that is we tend to boast. And when we boast, you, we use this little itty bitty thing in our mouth called our tongue to talk about how great we are. Folks, we are a speck of dust on a speck of dust and a speck of dust in a universe that is beyond our wildest imagination. We are a speck of dust on this earth, which is a speck of dust in this galaxy, which is a speck of dust itself in this universe, which is big beyond our wildest imagination. Now, the last analogy that James gives us is that of fire. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Now, this one we can relate to because each of us in this room have seen the damage that the tongue can do. Amen? We've seen it in our families growing up. We've seen it amongst our friends growing up. We've seen it destroy companies and rip churches apart. We've seen it destroy company, uh, countries. We've seen tongues lead nations into war. Almost every summer here in the Southwest, large sections of California, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico seem to be on fire with hundreds of thousands of acres going up in flames. That is the power of one single solitary flame. We in Arizona in particular are sensitive to this because we lost 19 young brave men, the Arizona hotshots who died giving their life to protect this state. Amen? We're going to honor them and remember them uh, forever because of what they've done. So we, have a, we know the damage that a fire can do. Well, just like a single solitary flame can take the lives of 19 men, it can do incredible damage. It can ruin relationships, fracture families, split churches, divide nations, and as I said, start wars. And Lord willing, we're not headed that way with China and Russia. To state it bluntly, and this is gonna be blunt, so listen very carefully. Some of you are gonna be shocked with what's about to roll off my mouth, but it's gonna roll off my mouth because it's in the Bible. The tongue can be used for hellish purposes. The tongue can be used by hellish, for hellish purposes. And many of you know that because you've been on the receiving end of somebody using their tongue for hellish purposes against you. But do not be mistaken and do not be so proud to think for a moment that you and I can't use our tongue for hellish purposes. Why do I say that? It's what James says. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by what? Hell. That's why I say the tongue can be used for hellish purposes. But before we go pointing fingers at everyone else for their use of their tongue in hellish purposes, stop and look in the mirror and ask, do I use my tongue in such a way? So powerful is the tongue, according to James, that he says this, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. 
gosh, he nails it. He nails it. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second. It is easier to capture and train a four-ton killer whale to jump through hoops at SeaWorld than it is to tame the human tongue. That's crazy. I mean, think about some, somebody someday said, hey, let's catch a killer whale and train, train it to jump through hoops and we'll sell tickets. They must have thought, you're crazy. We've done it. And yet we can't tame this thing. We can't tame this thing. We can tame that thing, but we can't tame this thing. And I have no doubt, by the way, as many of you know, I'm a young earth creationist. I believe that the, the, the earth is very, God created in six literal days, that the earth is very young. I believe that dinosaurs and man coexisted on the earth at the same time. Job talks about Leviathan and so on and so forth. So I believe that dinosaurs are even mentioned in the Bible. They were wiped out in the flood. More on that later. But here's the point. We, we look at movies like Jurassic Park and we go, wow, the velociraptor is so incredibly smart and in hunting mankind. No way. No way. James says we have tamed every animal on this planet. I have no doubt if velociraptors were alive today, we would tame them and sell tickets to ride on SeaWorld at. You could get tis, take your kids and grandkids to ride a velociraptor. I'm not kidding. That is what, that is what um, uh, we as human beings can do. We are the top of the food chain. We, have, we can subdue any animal under heaven and earth and use it for our purposes. But guess what? We cannot tame the human tongue. That's what James says. Folks, my friends, that should blow your mind and should weigh heavy on your heart. Because as believers, if we are not incredibly careful, we can go through life, this life, this short life that is but a breath, with our tongue being more of a liability than an asset in the hands of our God. If we're not careful, we can be like the people that James describes in this passage, people that are full of both blessing and curses. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Right? I can't tell you, and I've said it before, I'll confess it again, how many times I'm driving in the car, listening to my Christian music, I'm just like, praise you, Lord, I love you, that person's an idiot over there. Oh, Lord, you're so good. That jerk in front of me doesn't know how to break. Um, and I'm not kidding, I do it. And you're laughing because you do it too. You do it too. It is amazing. I can be in church and look over my shoulder and think, oh my gosh, and blah, 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 and then go back to worshiping God. Now you think every time I look over my shoulder, you're going to be, what? what's he looking at? Isn't it amazing that we can praise God in one breath, curse somebody and go right back to praising God in the next breath and not even think twice about it? This is the power of, of the human tongue. For James, our mouths are like springs of water, and the only water flowing from the mouth of a believer should be what? Fresh water, fresh water. He says this, does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? If you're thirsty and are in the mountains and go to a spring, do you want salt water? No way. I want fresh, cool mountain water. That's what I want. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? If I go to a fig tree, I don't want olives. If I go to a grapevine, I don't want figs. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Folks, it is no wonder that we see King David praying a prayer like this. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Amen? Ugh. Imagine if we hadn't kicked God out of the schools, the public school systems, and imagine if we had kids praying prayers like this before each school day. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Do you think we'd be living in a different generation? Yes, we would. We would. Now, here's the deal. I want to encourage everyone at this point because this passage is, James comes at it from a very negative standpoint. He's talking about the destructive nature of the tongue. It's hellish. It's a world of unrighteousness, as he says. And he's so right. He gets everything right, of course. But I want to look at this from a slightly different perspective this morning, a more positive one. Because believe it or not, there is a lot in this passage to be excited about. And here's why. Although the tongue is very powerful and can be used for evil and destructive purposes, you know what it means? It means that same power, when harnessed appropriately, can have tremendous impact for the kingdom of God. Amen? How did 12 men turn the Roman Empire on its head in one generation? They opened their mouths and they proclaimed truth. Amen? 
And I'm going to tell you what this generation needs. In a world of disinformation and fake news and everybody online spewing everything, what this generation needs is what the first, center, first generation, first century needed. It needs people who will use these little itty bitty things that God has put into our mouths to proclaim what's true and right. And not be ashamed of it and not be afraid to be persecuted for it. To use these little itty bitty things, this little itty bitty thing in our mouth, harness it for God's glory. It can be harnessed for great damage, but that's not going to be us. The world does that. We are different. We are a sanctified people with a sanctified mouth that are going to use our mouths to glorify God in this generation. And if it costs us everything, so be it. Let's go down swinging. Actually, let's say this. Let's go down preaching. Let's go down praising. Let's go down singing the glories of God. Amen? So every year, Time Magazine puts out a list of the 100 most influential people. Now, to be on that list, you are going to have to either be very rich, very famous, or have accomplished something very significant by worldly standards. Average people like you and me, we're not getting on that list. But here's where I want to encourage you guys. Listen to me very carefully. Do not think for a minute that just because you are not on a list like that, that you cannot be every bit as influential or even more so than the people on this list. The fact of the matter is, you have something in your possession. Listen very carefully, because what I'm, it's so important. You have something in your possession that when used properly has unlimited potential to impact people forever. And that is your tongue. And here's the great part about it. Your tongue can influence and impact people in a way no one else can. Because unlike the people of this world that make lists like this, whose influence is limited to temporal, temporal and trivial matters, believers have the ability to influence and impact people on what truly matters, eternal matters. And that, my friends, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, makes you one of the most unique and important people on the face of the planet. If people knew who you were when you walked in a room, they would fall at your knees and beg you to speak to them if they understood who you were. Not everyone can use their tongues for eternal purposes, but by the grace of God, you happen to be one of those people. Don't lose sight of who you are in Christ. I mean it. I think we as believers think, well, I'm just like everybody else. You are not. I've said it before. I will say it again. Every building you enter, every threshold you cross, every conversation you enter, that place is set apart and sanctified because a man or a woman of God is now present. Amen? And you have the ability to use this little itty bitty thing in your mouth that seems so insignificant and is so easy to forget about, you can use that to change history, to impact people eternally. How did 12 men turn the Roman Empire on its head in one generation? They used this little itty bitty thing to proclaim the glories of God. And what was needed in the first century is the same thing that is needed in the 21st century. Bold men and women who will stand up and use this little itty bitty thing to glorify God, to proclaim truth, to proclaim what's right, no matter the cost to them. Folks, we are living in a day and age where people are insane. They say, follow the science. They're not following the science. We are proclaiming, what is being said in culture is leading to absolute absurdity on so many fronts. If ever there were a time in which those of us who know the truth can use this little thing called our tongue for God's glory, it's now, amen? I hope you're with me. Folks, if it's not us, who's it going to be? If it is not the church, if it is not the saints of God, folks, that's why I said do not ever forget Every building you enter, every threshold you cross, every conversation you entered is now sanctified by your presence. Sanctified. By sanctified, I simply mean set apart. It is a man or a woman of God is present. And like I said, if people knew who you were when you walked in a room, they'd ask for your autograph. They'd follow your feet and say, preach to me the word of life. You have it on your tongue. Please tell me what I need to know about eternal things if they understood who you were. But they don't. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be any less bold in that moment. For God has given you something that has tremendous power, yes, to do incredible damage. But that is the way that we used to operate, the way of the world. But we don't operate that way anymore, do we? We are children of the living God who have been sanctified through and through by the Holy Spirit, which means that our tongues have been sanctified. And this little itty bitty thing that's easy to forget about can change the world. It can change people's lives if we will use it, if we will be so bold to use it. Not being afraid of the consequences. Listen, I don't want the people of this world to be more courageous than me. Do you? There are non-believers out there that are standing up for what's true and right. There's, there are non-believers out there that have common sense. 
But guys, we have biblical truth. We should have the loudest, proudest voices about who our God is and what he's done and the truth he has proclaimed. Amen? We should not be ashamed of anything that we stand for ever. It is no wonder that we see the early church. You know what the early church prayed for and asked for? I'll let them tell you. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. The early church is being persecuted. They're being threatened. And what do they pray for? Make us more bold. Lord, this little thing that, I, that you put in my mouth, I'm using it to proclaim your glory and it's making people mad and they're threatening me. What should I pray for? Make me more bold. <laughs> That's courage. Their tongues got them in trouble for the Lord and they're saying, Lord, let me get in more trouble for you. Let me use this little tongue with courage in this generation, even if it costs me everything. Make me more bold in the face of threats. Listen, I don't know what the future of the church is, you guys, but there's a good chance we are going to be, continue to be threatened and continue to be persecuted and continue to be shut your doors and do whatever. You no. May we be as bold as ever. The righteous are as bold as lions. What this country needs and what this world needs are lions roaming the countryside. Amen? The Apostle Paul, he's constantly, if you read the epistles, the letters that he wrote, he's constantly praying for people. I'm praying for you. I'm constantly interceding. Every time I, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. But on occasion, he asked for prayer. And when he asked for prayer, we, you should perk up because you go, well, what would Paul want prayer for? Here's what he wanted prayer for. And pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. The man that seemed most fearless in the first century was asking, pray for me and ask God to keep me bold and fearless in this generation because it's probably going to cost me. And it did. It cost him his life. But when Paul asked for prayer, he said, pray that my mouth be bold in this generation. You guys, the politicians in this day and age are bold. The university professors are bold. The people spewing nonsense, they're bold in their speech. Either we're going to match them with courage and conviction and the words rolling off of our mouths or we're not. But I want to go down preaching. I want to go down singing. I want to go down proclaiming the glories of God with this little thing that he has put in my mouth. Are you with me? I hope you are, and I hope I am. Pray for me that I have the courage to be, to use this little thing as I should in this generation. You know what's really cool? It's not just proclaiming the mysteries of the gospel. There's a million and one ways that you can use this little thing for God's glory. Let me give you one. Well, let me give you a couple, but let me, let me park on this one for a second. Use your tongues to pray for people. You want a great way to use your tongues for the glory of God? Start praying for people. And I don't just mean privately. Start asking people, can I pray for you? So true story, when COVID hit, all the restaurants shut down, you know this, but one of them was open and it was Garcia's restaurant over here. And by the way, Mexican food is like third on my list. I love Asian food first, Italian second, and then Mexican food. Who's with me? <laughs> all the cat people are with me, great. <laughs> <laughs> I love Asian food. It's top of my list. But Mexican's third, but it was the only restaurant that was open, so I started going there. And when I go, and I've told you guys this before, but when I go, I always ask waitresses and waitresses, can I, is there anything I can pray for you for? When they deliver the food, I always say, hey, I'm about to pray for this. I know you're busy. You go, but is there anything quickly that I can lift up when I pray? And a lot of times they'll say, yeah, pray for this, pray for that. I've had waitresses come back in tears because I prayed for them. I was going, I started going over there and I started asking, I, st I kept getting the same waitress and I said, can I pray for you? And she wanted nothing to do with it. Nothing. I mean, literally, it was as if I had leprosy. You know, it was like, what? You know, she probably had never had a customer say, can I lift something up? But I was persistent, and I kept using this little little bitty thing to keep asking her every time I was in there, can I pray? And eventually, I got her to crack, and she said, well, you can pray for my son. And then it was, you can pray for my mother. And I kid you not, I'm not exaggerating this at all, but a while, I went, a while ago, I went back in there, and she came up to me and said, will you pray for my mother? She sought me out. <laughs> listen, folks, as believers, people may not be willing to listen to you pontificate. People, 
if I invite people to come church, to church and hear me preach, they're like, well, that sounds fun. <laughs> people may not be willing to listen to you pontificate, but they will more than likely welcome your prayers. The people of this world are hurting, and our prayers are a compassionate way to say, God cares, we care, and you matter. Let me use this little thing to bless you right now. And the people will go, please, you're the only one that might be praying for me. Thank you. Thank you. Paul said this to Timothy, first of all, then, I urge you, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Your waiter, your waitresses, those people that you seem to forget about, open your mouth. Use this little, little bitty thing for God's glory in that situation. Or if you really want to blow people's minds, you want another way that you can blow people's minds in this generation? We live in a generation where everybody's focused on what is wrong. You want a great way to use your tongue to blow people's minds? Start giving thanks in all circumstances. Not just in some circumstances, in all circumstances. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We should be a rejoicing people, a thankful people. In a culture where everyone sees everything that is wrong, we can stand apart as a people who use this little bitty thing for amazing purposes by nothing else than being thankful. Give thanks in all circumstances, not some, all. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I do think that we can stand apart in this generation as a people who are just praising God, rejoicing that the sun is up, that the wind is hitting our face, that we get to enjoy our families, that there's still a relative amount of peace in the world. Amen? And despite all the stuff that has happened over the last couple of years, God is good, and he's been good to all of us. Finally, if you really, really want to start blowing people's minds away, just use your tongue to praise God. Amen? Psalm 59 says this, but I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. Let your neighbors hear you in the backyard praising God. Amen? Those slump block walls, they can't keep the word, they can't sing, keep my praises contained. For you have been a fortress and a refuge in the day of distress. Oh my strength, I will sing praises to you for you, God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Listen, in this day and age, everyone is singing someone's or something's praises. Everyone is singing someone's praises. Just listen to them. Let you and I be people who are singing the praises of our God, right? Amen? It is so easy for us as believers to get caught up in worldly things where we are singing the praises of the things of this world just like everybody else. No, let's step back and go, you can sing the praises of the things of this world. I'm going to sing the praises of my God. You're going to hear his praise on my lips continually. It'll be on, in, it'll be on my lips in the morning and in the afternoon and in the evening. You want to know how powerful the tongue is? And I close with this verse, you guys. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You guys, life is short. The days are evil. What rolls off your tongue is so incredibly important. You are not just anyone. You are saints of God whose feet have been set in this generation. Every door, every building you enter, every threshold you cross, every conversation you enter is sanctified because you are there. Make a difference while you are there. Use your tongues for great and mighty purposes. Amen? Make 2022 a year in which your tongue becomes an incredible asset in your service for the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come before you. And God, we were reminded by James of the incredible destructive nature of the tongue. And Lord, we do ask that you would set a guard over our tongues, God, that we might um, speak wisely in all occasions. But Lord, help us not to be motivated by fear. Let us use this resource that you have given to us for your glory. I pray for the saints in here and the saints that are watching online. God, ignite our faith. Light us up. May we be sold out for you in this generation, in a generation that needs people proclaiming what is true and right. God, may we be those people. Even if the world thinks we are crazy, God, we know that when we preach your word, when we proclaim what is true in your scriptures, we are on the right side of history. We love you. We thank you, God. And we go now boldly in your name. And the saints said with me, amen. God bless you. We'll see you right here next week. God bless. God bless.